Being a foreign worker in any country is not easy. But in Israel, it's probably so much more difficult. Especially when war hits and you're working in a field somewhere in the south of Israel on the Gaza border and you get abducted, kidnapped, or killed. Or you're a Filipino soldier in the Israeli army that goes out to combat and gets killed. And now your mother that had to work three jobs to support you while you were growing up is left all alone. So today I want to tell you some stories about foreign workers in Israel. We got Thai, Filipinos, uh, Chinese, obviously like Europeans, uh, East Europeans like uh, Ukrainians, Moldovans, uh, Belarus. There's all kinds. A lot of them are illegal. A lot of them come on a tourist visa and overstay their visa and find a, a job and try to make their life here doing manual labor, working in the fields and cleaning in, in construction, a lot of them. You see it by sector, like uh, all the Filipinos and the Thai, most of them work in agriculture. Not all of them are illegal. A lot of them come because um, this is what they know and this is what they can do. And, and here they would get better money for doing the work that they would have ended up doing back home. So they come here. It's not a lot of people. For example, the Chinese, there's like 10,000 Chinese working in Israel. I know this because we have a pastor friend. He runs a Chinese mission church in uh, Tel Aviv. There was a story in the news uh, just a little while ago about some construction workers, Chinese construction workers that got fed up with the way that they were treated. Their contractor didn't pay them or didn't pay them enough or something. So they went out and like kidnapped his wife, tried to get ransom. So they're in prison, and I know this because I've been to prisons as a translator um, to help uh, the people inside. A lot of them, especially if they need translation, is because they're, they're foreigners. And because my visits to the prison are with a prison ministry, a Christian ministry, you can only talk to Christians. So if you're Chinese or any other nationality, as a foreigner, you're, you come into the prison or jail, I guess it is, and you're processed, they ask you what religion you are. And if you don't say up front that you're a Christian, and of course you don't know what, what, whether that's gonna help you or not, and a lot of times you'll probably, they'll probably hide it, then you won't be able to talk to anybody from the outside who comes in as a Christian ministry because there's a big separation of religion. Like a Christian can only marry a Christian and a Muslim can only marry a Muslim. And if you have no religious affiliation, then you can't marry either one of those. If you come into the prison as a Christian, then anybody comes uh, as a Christian ministry and get help, spiritual advice, and whatever. Um, uh, the ministry that comes and talks to you can coordinate some kind of help for you. So that's just one example of the kinds of stuff that these uh, people go through. Obviously, it's not an easy life. You probably don't make that much money. You probably don't live in a nice neighborhood. You probably don't have the best apartment. Like I was telling you the story about the Egyptian migrant workers. They share small apartments between seven, eight people. And then the war comes and you get kidnapped by some terrorists and get taken to Gaza. And nobody knows that you're there and nobody really is fighting for you because there's still a lot of hostages in Gaza. I have a story about that, check it out. And all those people, most of those people, there's somebody fighting for them. There's somebody always, the memorials, there's always talks with the government, there's always petitions, there's always, there's all these people being very vocal about getting these hostages out. Most of them, though, are talking about specific people. The Americans, uh, the American hostages, there's somebody speaking to the American government about them. But there's very little being done about, I think his Thai, I uh, interviewed uh, some people that are speaking out on his behalf. I'm not sure if there's an embassy here and there's an ambassador that's fighting for his rights. He's still in captivity somewhere in Gaza. Some of them were killed in the kibbutzes when uh, the attacks happened. I was interviewing somebody from the local government there in the south, in the Gaza uh, border region, and they were saying how along with all the Israelis that got attacked, there was a number of them that got, that got killed. Uh, by the attackers. Not every one of them works in the fields. Some of them work with the elderly, uh, help taking care of the elderly, and they would be there in the house when the attackers came in and they would try to protect and they get killed. There's also Filipino soldiers in the army. I interviewed a, a mother who lost her son. Also, a migrant worker came here to Israel like 25 years ago with uh, a little boy. She had to raise him by herself, so she worked like three jobs during his childhood. He was kind of a latchkey kid and he got into a lot of trouble. He ends up going to the army to try to change his life around as a young man. And the mother of the fallen Filipino soldier said something really interesting about Israel. When she first came here 24 
something years ago. She had first gone to Singapore from the Philippines as a migrant worker, and she says that she wasn't, she didn't feel welcome there. There was a lot of discrimination, and when she came here, she says that she fell in love with the people. And it was the same thing about her son. She she told the story, a heart wrenching story about how she, as a mother, she had that feeling because he had finished the army, and he was about to get married. And uh, the war starts, and he says, I got called up and I have to go, Mom. And then the last time that she saw him, she told him she was crying, trying to get him to, to stay. He didn't make it back. But the reason that he said that he had to go and, and fight when the war started and he got called up is because he felt that he was part of this people and he needed to protect this country. Takeaway, life for a migrant worker is hard. But people coming here from all over the world, coming to Israel. I've heard this from anybody, from Africans and Europeans and, and Russians and, and um, Asians. They fall in love with this country. They fall in love with this people. It's funny how people outside of Israel are so quick to demonize Israel. Come to Israel, even in time of war, there's plenty of people coming to Israel. I just heard an interview from this Lebanese a refugee that lived in Syria and then made it to Germany. And she talks about how she had been uh, an atheist and obviously grew up in a Muslim culture and saw how horrible that is. And even as a, as a Lebanese in, in Syria, she saw the misogyny and, the, and all the evil of, of that regime. There's no outcry about Syrians being killed, uh, but the, the, the first idea of planes going up in the air send an outcry throughout the world. And in this interview, she talks about how after October 7th, she finally decided to come to visit Israel, even though that stamp in her passport will forever ban her from going back to Syria or Lebanon. There's plenty of people that come to Israel even during the war. There's plenty of people that, as they come to Israel, they recognize the value of this country, they recognize the value of this people. And all the outcry and all the, the crazy words that people speak towards Israel, starts to make no sense. Again, I'm not political, I'm not justifying anything that the government does. There's no benevolent government, not here, not where you live, by the way. I'm just saying, there's real people living here and I wanna tell their stories. So come back tomorrow for another one.